Today we'll be looking at the subject, Are Christians Affected by Generational Curses? I hope this video will be a blessing to you and if you would like to receive more videos like these, please consider subscribing to this channel. God bless you. There are many Christians who walk in fear because they think tribulation in their life is due to a generational curse. Um, there are primarily two reasons for this. And we can see a trend in some churches uh, blaming every sin and every problem on some type of generational curse. Firstly, people believe a generational curse is thought to be passed down from one generation to another through a demon that stays in the family. Such a family may have a history of diseases and issues with, finance, uh, with finances and all sorts of other issues as well. Secondly, a generational curse is also believed by some to be passed down from one generation to another due to rebellion against God. The scripture used for this is in Exodus 20, 5-6, saying, You shall not bow down to them or serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and the fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. So today, um, let us look at three ways the scripture shows that followers of Christ are free from any generational curses. Firstly, the generational passing of a curse does not apply to a Christian. Let us begin by looking at the scripture in Exodus 20 verses 5 and 6, which states that the iniquity of the fathers is visited on the children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate him. Whenever we read the Bible, it is vital to study the Bible passages in their context. Not only in its immediate context, but also in light of other scriptures as well. So every time you do not do this, you will run into all sorts of problems like this current one as well. So to understand Exodus 20, 5 to 6, we also need to read Ezekiel 18, 20. This is one of many similar passages. And in Exodus 18, 20, it says, The soul who sins shall die. The son shall not suffer for the iniquity of the father, nor the father suffer for the iniquity of the son. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon himself, and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon himself. So how can we reconcile these two passages? Peter Vermigli, a reformer from 1499 to 1562, explains this difference really well by saying, just how God visits the iniquity of the parents to the children unto the third and fourth generation, the law itself declares well enough from the added statement, those hating me. From this, it is apparent that only the children who are like their parents will bear their sins. If they depart from their wickedness, they will not bear their sins. Hallelujah. So the condition in this passage is that the father's iniquity is visited on the children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate him and walk according to their father's sin. In contrast, God shows steadfast love to thousands of those who love him and keep his commandments. Praise God. So what these pas passages show is the abundant grace of our God. The difference here is between those who hate him and those who love him. The iniquity visited on the third and fourth generations is a representation of a small number rather than an exact number in comparison to God showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love him. Amen. 
So these passages show that iniquity is only visited on those who continue to hate God as their fathers or families did before them. If you are a follower of Christ, it means that you don't no longer hate him, but you love him. And if you love him, then he shows you steadfast love and not iniquity. Hallelujah. Secondly, a true Christian has broken free from generational curses. What is the secret to breaking free from a generational curse? Well, the Bible tells us that the only way to break free from this curse is through repentance. The moment you accept Jesus Christ as your Savior, the Lord breaks any generational curse because we are now under a new covenant. Romans 8 1 says, There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. You see, the death of Jesus ushered in a new beginning that breaks all curses and he redeems all who believe in him. We have received victory and freedom in Christ Jesus and not condemnation. So, if Jesus doesn't condemn us for our own sins, then why would he hold us responsible for any crimes committed by others? John 8:36 says, So if the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. Hallelujah. Jesus paid it all on the cross, and we are completely free from all sins. Hallelujah. Or from the condemnation of sin. Colossians 1, 21-22 says, And you who once were alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, he has now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death, in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him. Praise God. So I want you to be sure that you are entirely redeemed from any curse. Colossians 1.13 says, He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of His beloved Son. You see, salvation brings true deliverance and protection from Satan. Again, in Colossians 2.13-15 it says, And you who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses by cancelling the record of death that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. Then it says he disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to shame by triumphing over them in him. You see, once you are a true child of God, then all your sins are forgiven. And he has disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them. The devil is disabled and he has no power over you because you now belong to Christ Jesus. Amen. Thirdly, Christians cannot be possessed by a demon. The Bible teaches us that demons cannot indwell a true believer. 2 Corinthians 6, 15-16 says, What accord has Christ with Belial? Or what portion does a believer share with an unbeliever? What agreement has the temple of God with idols? For we are the temple of the living God. As God said, I will make my dwelling among them and walk among them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And again in 1 John 4, 4, it says, Little children, you are from God and have overcome them. For he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. Hallelujah. Friends, understand that once you are saved, then it is Christ who dwells in you. And if Christ is in you, then you are his, he lives in you, and you no longer belong to the kingdom of darkness. There is no power in this world that can change this fact. Jesus gives us a parable to confirm this in Mark 3.27, saying, 
but no one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds the strong man then indeed he may plunder his house you see Christ is the strong man in you and be assured that there is no power to bind him and then plunder you it is the holy spirit that dwells in you and at this point some may say the only thing that can allow satan to enter you is your own choice friends if it were left to your own choice you would be long lost and that is why christ has given you his holy spirit to keep you to the very end to ensure that his power is what sustains you and not your own 1 corinthians 1 8 to 9 says who will sustain you to the end guiltless in the day of our lord jesus christ you see god is faithful by whom you were called into the fellowship of his son jesus christ our lord amen it is his power and not our own that guards us 1 peter 1:5 says who by god's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time again 2 corinthians 1:21 and it's and it is god who establishes us with you in christ and has anointed us and who has also put his seal on us and given us his spirit in our hearts as a guarantee hallelujah so it is not what you do in your weakness that can allow a demonic spirit in your life instead it is the power of god through his holy spirit who is the guarantee and guards you until you receive your inheritance he will not allow any other authority to indwell his possession and where his spirit dwells what a blessed promise that is to you and to me so in conclusion be assured that no generational curse can inhibit a christian nor can you be demon possessed but ensure that you have actually received jesus christ and that you are a true follower of christ just by following a prayer of salvation doesn't make you a christian it is not a magic formula that once you say it makes you saved it isn't enough to recite the sinner's prayer no matter how many times you say it true salvation means you must bear fruit it starts with repentance by admitting your sins and asking god for forgiveness we we turn from our old ways and turn to god acts 3:19 says repent therefore and turn back that your sins may be blotted out so after we repent and accept jesus christ as our savior we must bear fruit in accordance with our repentance luke 3:8 says bear fruit in keeping with repentance this is only possible through christ's finished work on the cross only his holy spirit and grace can empower us to live a saved life in relationship with the father So I pray that you have been encouraged and that you no longer have a fear of any generational curse because you are now a child of the living God. I hope you have been blessed today. God bless you and amen.